today, we as a church, we're beginning a 21 days of prayer. I've been talking about it for weeks. I hope that you're on board. I hope you have all of the resources you need to, to track with us through this. But this time is when I am personally asking you, the Journey Church, to go on a journey of prayer where we're going to make prayer a focus and we're going to go deeper at the same time. That is my hope for you. It's my hope that this time of focused prayer, this time of, of going deeper in our prayer life, that it will help your prayer life be bigger and better than it's ever been before. And maybe that you'll find that you pray more or more often, or maybe, maybe at the end of this time, you'll feel more confident in talking to God. That's my hope through this 21 days, through this series that we're going to be in. And so uh, we're going to jump right in. So you can go ahead and get out your, uh, your sermon notes, or uh, these are the notes you can find in the YouVersion Bible app. If you have that downloaded on your phone, uh, just click on events, and you'll find our church based on your location. But let's take a look. Here's our, here's our uh, focus scripture throughout this time. It's Luke 11, 1, and it says this. It says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. Now tuck that away for later. We're going to talk about that idea of a certain place that Jesus had. Uh, so maybe underline that and tuck it away for later. But, but one day when Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And so in this moment, we see the disciples turning to Jesus, and they say, look, we've been praying our whole lives. Like, we've, we've been praying, but, but when you pray, but when you pray, you do it in a way that's different. You do it in a way that's, that's powerful. You do it in a way that's appealing. You do it in a way that's, that's real and, and, and fresh. Teach us how to do that. Guide us that way. Show us how you pray that way. And you know, for many of us, we have been raised in faith traditions where prayer wasn't talked about as something that, that, that should be or even could be all of those things, appealing, fresh, exciting. Very few people that I talk to say that their prayer life is exciting and good. For most people, for most people, maybe you can relate to this, prayer can feel like it's a duty. Or sometimes, maybe this is you, you feel like that there are often times where you just don't know what to pray. Somebody asks you to pray and, and, and we just, we just kind of lock up and we say, oh man, I don't even know what to say. And so it's my hope that throughout the month of August that you'll not only hear about the importance and value of prayer, but that you'll walk away each week with something practical that will help this become a part of your life. And not only that prayer will become a part of your life, but that your prayer life will become alive. Amen. That your prayer life will become something regular, something exciting, something that you're actually looking forward to with anticipation. And you know, today's message, out of all of my messages throughout the series, today's message is probably the most practical. We're going we're gonna to dig in, and we're going to get super practical today. And so uh, it may not be real inspirational, but it will be practical. It'll be stuff that you can walk out of here even this afternoon and begin to apply to your prayer life. Because what is true when our prayer life isn't our go-to, when our prayer life isn't the first thing that we think of, especially in our everyday, in our everyday lives, our lives can be missing out on something very crucial. Very important. And I want to challenge us, and this is the big idea for the message today, I want to challenge us to make prayer our first response and not our last resort. Make prayer our first response and not our last resort. As I said, today's message is going to be super practical. I hope that today, this message, will get us all on the right foot to have a successful 21 days of prayer. This, this message... I hope, will far exceed the 21 days of prayer, in fact. I hope that what you learn here today, what you discover here today, will propel you into day 22, 23, and going forward. I hope that the things that I share with you today become a part of your everyday life and that you continue to put these things into practice forever. I know that's a bold statement, forever. I hope that you never stop doing the things that we talk about here today it is my sincere hope for you. So I want to show you something that, that actually works. 
I want to get super practical. And so the idea of today's message, it comes from two verses in Scripture. I want to show them to you. Here's the first one. It's found in Luke 18.1. It says, one day Jesus told his disciples a story. Now you can, you can read on and see exactly what that story was in the next few verses. But he told his disciples a story, a story to show that they should what? Always pray. And what? Yes. Never give up. They should always pray and never give up. Jesus says to them, I want you to always pray. Always pray. Always pray. And what happens if that doesn't work? Well, that's why you go to the next part. Don't give up. Keep praying. Keep doing it. I want you to always pray and never give up. And as if that wasn't clear enough, flip over to 1 Thessalonians. We see an even clearer description of what he expects. Never stop praying. Never stop praying. Plain and simple. Don't stop praying. That's a whole verse. If you're looking to memorize a verse, maybe you should start here. Never stop praying. You got it. Never stop praying. And what I want to offer you today is something that I think is pretty cool. Something that I believe has a lot of personal application for all of us. Because hopefully it will lead us to never stop praying. So we can make prayer a part of our everyday lives. In fact, what I would say is that I desire on the deepest levels to make the journey church, to see the journey church a praying church. I want our church to be a church of prayer. I want us to be known in our community as a church that prays. Even if people don't necessarily agree with our theology or everything else that we do, I want them to be able to say, I don't agree with what they do, but they're a praying church. They're a church that believes in the power of prayer. They're a church that prays. I want it to be known of us that we pray. Because Jesus says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. That's the journey church. And you know, this past Wednesday night, we had our monthly prayer service. Happens every month. Happens on the first Wednesday of every month. And it was a powerful time of prayer. We have prayer teams at the end of most services that are here to pray with you about anything you have, any need you have. We're going to have them today. In fact, at the end of the service, if you have a prayer need, you want somebody to pray with you and for you, you can come forward and receive prayer from these teams. We pray at our biweekly staff meeting that we have here. This is a group of mostly volunteers that come together every other Monday. We have a meeting tomorrow, and we spend time in prayer. We pray. We're a praying church. We had a powerful time of prayer yesterday. Can I get a witness? Yesterday at my home, I invited some of the leadership of our church over, and we had a powerful time of prayer. God was there. God shows up. We are a praying church, and that's just a few examples of the way we make prayer a priority. And so what I want to share with you next is just just a way to take steps to make prayer a lifestyle for you, a lifestyle of prayer. And I think it's a way for each of us to grow in our prayer lives. All of us. Some of us may do all three of these things. Maybe you've got one out of three. Maybe you don't do any of these. Wherever you're at, these three things, I believe, will help you develop this lifestyle of prayer that will be meaningful, will be exciting, will be something that you look forward to. And so I want to challenge you up front, as I'll probably do every week, as I do with most of my series, try it out. Just try out the things that I'm saying. Just give it a week even. Try it for a week. See what happens. See if you don't notice a difference, especially on today's topic in prayer. Try it for a week. So here's the first. Here's the first way to begin to develop a lifestyle of prayer, and that's to identify a certain time to pray. Identify a certain time in your calendar, in your day, in your schedule to make room for God. Identify that. And so for some of you, you're going to put it on your calendar. You're going to say, God, You're going to put God on your calendar and you're going to say, for that half hour, for that hour, that is God's. And I'm going to make it reoccurring. Every day at that time, I'm going to meet with God. Whatever it is for you, schedule it. Find a certain time that works for you. Because listen, it doesn't work to just give him your leftovers. You've got to give him your best. You've got to make him a priority. Put it on your calendar. Schedule it. Make time for him. Carve out time in your day to spend time with God in prayer. Give him the best part of your day. Give him the best of your day. Don't give him your leftovers. And when you schedule it, 
do your best to not miss it. Sure, you're going to miss it from time to time, but do your best to stay faithful to that time. Be dedicated to that time. I love the example that Daniel gives us. Daniel chapter 6 says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, this decree that came out from the king, that they could no longer bow their knee to God in prayer. So Daniel, he learns about this, and he goes home upstairs to his room where the windows are open towards Jerusalem. And three times, three times a day, in other words, he had these times throughout his day, three times, that he bowed down. He got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. In other words, it was a habit for him. He had done it regularly. This is something that he was used to doing. He had it scheduled for himself. Daniel, he had a certain time that he dedicated to God in prayer. And if you want prayer to work for you, this is a key to making it happen. This is a key to making it happen. Try it this week. Sit down tonight and say, this is the time each day this week that I'm going to give to God. It'll make a difference. So find a certain time. Here's the second way to make prayer a lifestyle for you. The second thing is to find a certain place. To find a certain place. Those that I know that have the most successful prayer lives, they have a prayer closet. It may not actually be a closet, but they have a place that they go regularly and often to get with God. A place where there are no distractions, a place where they can really cry out to God, a place where they can go and they know that God will meet them there. It's their place of refuge. It's their place that they go regularly and pray and get alone with God, away from the busyness of life. I love the old hymn. I'm not a singer, so I'm not going to try to sing it. But I come to the garden alone, while the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none has ever known. Don't you just love that old hymn? Man, I got chills just reading that out loud. Get alone with God. There's just something about having a place where you can go and be alone with him. Jesus, Jesus had this place. It says in Mark 1, 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, he left the house, and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. He had a place that he went to, a place away from everyone and everything where he could unplug and he could focus his energy and his his devotion to God. Find a place. Most people believe that the place that he went was the Garden of Gethsemane. And from that place where Jesus went, he could look down and actually see Jerusalem, the place that he loved. But he had a place, and so should we. We should have a place that we go. And so give God time And find a place, a regular place that you meet with him. And then here's the third real quick. You need to have a certain plan. You need to have a certain plan. So you need to have a time, a place, and then a plan. I want you to go into your prayer time with a plan of what you're going to pray about. Often our prayer lives don't work because we have no idea what to pray about. We just don't know. We just don't take the time to plan for it. When the disciples said to Jesus, teach us to pray... He responds with a plan. He replies with a plan. He, he gives them a plan of how they should pray. We call it the Lord's Prayer. You're probably familiar with it. And that is not meant necessarily to just be a prayer that we repeat. It's a prayer that if we unpack it piece by piece, we will see a, an outline, a plan for how we should spend our time in prayer. In fact, we're going to do that in a couple of weeks. We're going to look at just the Lord's Prayer. And together, we're going to unpack each element of that and and see how it guides us in our time of prayer. But here's what it says in Luke chapter 11 in his response to them. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Now, we're going to dig into that more, so I don't want to unpack it too much with you today. I will just say that that is a great model for prayer. We're gonna, I'll guide you through it. I'll teach you how to pray through it. It'll be, it'll be impactful for you. I guarantee it. But it's a model that Jesus gave the disciples. And I think it's a model that Jesus would say to us today how we should plan our prayer time. How we should plan our prayer time. 
And I think it's a great way to meet God in prayer. And you know, a couple of the resources that we have over at the Welcome Center, I I can see that a lot of you have picked them up already, and that's great. But if you haven't yet, we have a prayer calendar. It's a calendar that I've developed for the next 21 days, starting today. And it will tell you exactly what you should pray for each day for the 21 days. There's your plan. There's your plan. As you, as you approach God, make this a part of your prayer time with him. The second resource that I want to point you to that we've developed just for you is this booklet. And it says pray first on the front of it. I'm going to unpack pray first with you in just a minute. But uh, how many of you picked one of these up already? There's a lot that are missing over there. So if you haven't gotten one yet, uh, there's more printing, I think, right now, actually. Uh, and you can pick one up after the service. But in here, there are all kinds of prayer models. There is information in here about how you can pray, how you can plan your time with God each day. And it even gives you a journal in the back. You can write down prayer requests. You can write down family members you're praying for. And you can write down answers to prayer that you see in your life. So pick up one of these. It will help you plan your prayer time. I've used this booklet before. I've used it in my prayer time. And I can tell you that when I use it, when I used it, my prayer life grew. I saw growth in my prayer life. Because I had a plan. I didn't just approach God and say, okay, um, I know I should pray for something here. But I had a plan. I knew exactly what I needed to pray for and about. So grab those resources before you go. But I think it would be huge. And I bet you would agree. I think it would be huge if we became a praying people. That the Journey Church... That we would find ourselves being marked, being known as people of prayer. That we would have a time, that we would have a place, and that we would have a plan. That our prayer lives would be, would be something that we would be marked by. I think it would dramatically change your life, my life, the life of our church, and our community around us. It would change the world if we would become people of prayer. And so I want you to commit to put these things into practice. Begin to develop for yourself this lifestyle of prayer. Find putting these three things in place for yourself. Find a way that works for you. And so today what I want to do is I want to talk to you about a rally cry. I don't know if I've ever done this before, but I'm going to do it today. A rally cry. You guys know what that is? It's kind of something that that a group of people come around and it becomes the thing that they say. And so I I want to... introduce you to this mantra, this, 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 this rally cry, and I want us all to memorize this because we're going to talk about it because I think it, I think it will mark our church for years to come. And it's two words. It's just two words. It's the words pray first. Say it. Say pray first. Pray first. That was good. Pray first. Pray first. Uh, that was weak. One more time. Pray first. Excellent. So before we act, action is good, but before we act, before we do anything else, we're going to pray first. You got it. Man, you guys are smart. That's awesome. Before we have an appointment at the office, we're going to pray first. So when the admin calls back and they say, you know, so-and-so is here to meet for you, we're going to say, hold, hold on. Give me, give me just 30 seconds. You're going to hang up the phone and you're going to say, God, I pray to you to bless this meeting. I pray that you, would, that you would just give me your ideas, give me your favor, and God help us to make a boatload of money. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, send them in. We're just gonna, we're gonna pray first. We're gonna pray first. Before the kids go off to school, we're gonna pray first. We're gonna grab them and say, in Jesus' name, let him be a leader and not a follower. Amen. We're gonna pray first. We're gonna pray first in every situation. We do it with meals a lot, don't we? We pray first. We pray first, but what would it look like if in every situation that we find ourselves in, we prayed first? In every appointment, every phone call, every email, every text message, what would it look like if we would just stop and pray first? Before we leave for vacation, one of our favorite things to do is to pray first. Before we back out of the driveway, we stop and we say, God, keep us safe. Help us to have a great time. In Jesus' name, we pray first. Let's all commit to be people who pray first. first. Let's commit to it. And I want to show you something that's really cool in 2 Chronicles. Maybe some scripture you're familiar with. But it says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain. Let me me modernize that for you for a minute. When, When you face bad days, 
when you get that diagnosis from the doctor, when, when, when your kids are misbehaving and you just don't know what to do, or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, here's what I want you to do first. If my people who are called by my name will hum, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear them from heaven and forgive their sin and, and heal their land. God is saying that I want to see my people have their first response to be prayer. Pray first before every meal, before the kids leave for school, before the phone call, before the text message. We're going to pray first. Pray first. What are we going to do? Pray first. All right, so here are, here are uh, four things that all need your action. They all need you to do it. And actually, ushers, uh, can, you, can you help me out here for just a minute? Uh, can you go ahead and stand to your feet, ushers? And uh, I have a gift that I want to give to everybody. I'm not Oprah, so it's not like a new car or anything. <laughs> you get a car, you get a car. <laughs> it's so bad, only two of you laughed. But what I have for you today, and I'm actually wearing one, is I have these bracelets. And so we're going to distribute these. Everybody gets one. So if, yeah, if you guys can, can, can begin to distribute these down the rows, these bracelets. And on them, they have two words. Can anybody guess what the two words are? Great. Man, you guys are good. I love it. Now listen, these bracelets, these bracelets, I want you to get one. I want you to wear one. Our kids upstairs, they're getting one today. And so I want this to be a reminder on your wrist. That when you look down and you see this bracelet, that you're reminded to pray first. See, I told you I want to get super practical with you today. Because I think this idea, this philosophy can change the very trajectory of our church. It can change everything if we will just remember to make prayer our first response and not our last resort. If we remember to pray first, pray first. So get a bracelet, put it on, wear it. Now listen, I'm not going to check your wrist every Sunday, okay? There's going to come a point in time where I take mine off too, okay? And so if you're not wearing it, it's okay. I'm not going to say, hey, where's your, where's your bracelet? Why aren't you wearing your bracelet? This is up to you. This is between you and God. But I wanted to resource you. I wanted to give you something to hopefully make this a little bit easier to apply. And so pray first. Pray first. It's such a simple philosophy. It's such a simple idea. But man, doesn't it have just compounding uh, 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 impact? I mean, it's such, such a good thing. All right, so, so I want to get a little more practical with you. And I want to give you four things. Four things that I want you to begin praying first for, okay? So here it is, super practical. The first is this, I want you to pray first for our nation. Pray first for our nation. Listen, our, our nation, it needs prayer. It needs a lot of prayer. And you know, there are lots of opinions out there about what's happening there's a lot of stuff that's going on that's just simply not good. But I want to encourage us all that, you know, when the elections come around, before we, before we vote, that we would pray first. That before we post an article or read an article or share an article, that we would pray first. Before we post that meme that, that attacks another group of people, that we would pray first. Before we would type out our thoughts to anything happening around us on social media, that we would pray first. And listen, I want to encourage you to participate. I am personally appalled at the number of people who simply do not vote. I'll talk about that more as the elections approach. But we need to, we need to vote. But before we vote, we need to pray. We need to pray first. We need to participate, but let's pray first. Because why? Because prayer changes things. My comment to that post on social media doesn't change a darn thing. And can I just say that I don't lift my eyes to the hill. My help doesn't come from Capitol Hill. My help comes from the Lord. Amen? And if you put your hope in elections or in government, I'm so sorry for you. Because they will fail you every time. They will disappoint you every time. Your hope, 
Your hope needs to be in the one who can help you, the one who can change things, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. We see this in Scripture, of course. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I urge then, first of all, that request, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives with godliness and holiness. I'll put it this way. When's the last time you prayed for our president? When's the last time you prayed for our Supreme Court? When's the last time you took time to pray for our elected officials here locally? Listen, our job, hear this, please. Our job is not to go around angry. Our job is not to go around saying, get that person out of office and get that person into office. Our job, Christians, listen, our job is to be a blessing. God, in Jesus' name, let your blessing and favor be poured out on them. God bless America in Jesus' name. I love the way it's put in Proverbs eleven eleven. Through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. God bless Avon. Bless Plainfield. God bless Danville and Brownsburg. God bless Indianapolis. In Jesus' name, I pray for revival in our churches and in our community. I pray against crime and against drugs and all of the stuff that's not from you. I pray that light would come and that there would be no more darkness. In Jesus' name, pray first and bless our nation. Bless those that serve. Be a blessing. All right, I'll get off that soapbox. Here's the second thing. So first is to pray for our nation. Here's the second thing. Pray first for your family. Pray first for your family. I want to put your minds at ease a little bit. Consuela, I hope you're okay with what I'm getting ready to share. I want to give you a little peek into the Parsons house. I just want to put your minds at ease and give you a little peek into our home. We have four children, ages nine to two. And listen, listen. Our kids are not walking around the house carrying their Bibles. Our kids are not coming up to me and saying, Father, let me show you what the Lord revealed to us in the Holy Scripture this morning. (laughs) That is not happening in our home. That does not happen. Man, I, I guess I'd love for that to happen, but it doesn't. The reality is it just doesn't. And I know sometimes that certain people can be put on pedestals, and, and I want to I caution you against that. One time, one time we were on vacation, and one of those days of vacation was a Sunday. And don't tell anybody, but I, I didn't go to church on Sunday. I needed a break. I took a break. But a friend of ours asked us, now when you're on vacation and it falls on a Sunday, does Tim like prepare a message and like you guys have church in your home or in your hotel room? We're like, no, no, he doesn't do that. He does not do that. There's still time of devotion and prayer and all that stuff. But no, we don't, we don't have church in our hotel room. I don't know if that makes you feel any better or not, but those things aren't happening for us. My point is you've got to figure out what works for you. You have to figure out what works in your home. What works for my family may not work for yours. In fact, it probably won't work for yours. You have to figure out your uniqueness and figure out how you can tap into the power of God in your own home with your children, with your family. Don't just copy what somebody else is doing. Figure it out. Take time to pray about it. Figure it out. God will direct you. One thing that we are constantly working on in our home is trying to find time to pray for one another. Taking time to pray. I mean, we pray at night. If Consuela and I forget, our daughter Victoria, she will remind us. She came into my room the other night and she said, Daddy, guess who prayed for me tonight? And I was like, oh, Mommy? She said, nope. I said, "Uh, one of your brothers? Nope. I said, the mouse in your drawer? I don't, who who prayed for you? She said, nobody. Will you pray with me? I'm like, (laughs) Okay. Gotta love kids. When kids go off to school, you know, I get the pleasure of being able to take them in the morning. 
And especially when the day's gotten off to a rough start and we get and we pull into the, the parking lot, I often turn to my kids and say, hey, can I just pray for you real quick before you go in? And we spend some time in prayer. We're working on it. We're not perfect at it, but we're working on that. We're getting better at that. That works for us. Those things work for us. You've got to figure out what works for you. Figure it out. Find a way. Find a way to welcome prayer into your home, specifically. Here's what, here's what Nehemiah says. He says, remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Fight for them. Intercede for your family. Lift them up in prayer. Pray first. Pray first for your family. Put them at the top of your priority list. Not as leftovers. Pray first for your family. That's the second thing. Here's the third. Third thing is this. Pray for the lost. I expected more amens. Pray for the lost. Pray for the lost. If you want to know what the Lord is most interested in right now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. It's the lost. He is most interested in the lost. I love you but he's most interested in the lost. And prayer should always include the lost. Why? Because that is what is on the Father's heart right now. Lost people. The lost, they're already on his mind, and so they should also be on our minds. Pray for the lost. It's very very clear in Scripture. Matthew chapter 9. But when he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion because they were harassed and helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. He looks down in this moment and he sees our world and he sees the very people that are most harassed, that are most helpless, that most lack leadership in their lives and his heart breaks for them. He is moved with compassion for them. And listen, so should we be. We should be moved with compassion when we see people around us that are broken, that are hurting, hurting, that are helpless. We need to be moved with compassion. And then I love what Jesus does in this moment. He sees them. He's moved with compassion. He explains why, and then he pivots. He turns to the disciples, and he says, the harvest, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. And so what should they do? He tells them. He says, therefore, pray. Pray. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out laborers into the harvest. Pray. There are seven billion people on this planet, but the problem is, is that we don't have enough people out there doing anything about it. There's not enough workers. There's not enough people focused on reaching the lost. I've been at this church for six months. I sincerely hope that you've noticed that the lost are important to me. I care deeply about those that don't know Jesus. It breaks my heart when I know somebody does not know Jesus. That is our primary responsibility. That once we begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, our responsibility is to go and tell them. Go and tell them. There's not enough workers. Because listen, the truth is, is that not every Christian is a worker. There are far too many consumers among us Christians. There are far too many people that are most concerned about what's in it for me. What do I get? What's what's there for me? Far too concerned about comfort. Because listen, reaching the lost, it's messy. It requires risk. It requires us coming to the end of ourselves and saying, man, there is something more out here. There is something more that I'm being called to do. The workers are few. And so what do we do about it? We pray. Jesus says, therefore, pray. Pray. Pray first. If this is your church home, can I implore you once again? Get involved. 
Find a place to serve. Find a place to to create your own ministry. A place where you can help reach the lost. Because, Because when you serve, you are responding to this verse in Matthew. It's not that we need help. It's not about fulfilling an open position. No, the idea is that we need more people out there telling others about Jesus. We need more people out there showing others through their actions who Jesus is. We need more people out there inviting others into a relationship with the Savior of the world. And serving allows us to be an answer to that prayer. Lord, send workers. And when you step in to serve, you are a part of that answer to prayer. And that's why I'm begging you in many ways. Find a place to serve. Be a person who serves. Be a greeter at the front door. Hold a baby so that mom can get into the sanctuary and hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Be a laborer. Pray for the lost. Every day. And you know, I think there's some, some blanks on your outline, if I'm not mistaken. Can somebody say yes to confirm that? There's some blanks on the back of your outline. I want you to write down a name. A name of someone you know who is harassed and helpless. Someone you know who is like a sheep without a shepherd. Somebody that you know needs to be introduced to Jesus Christ. Write their name down. Begin to pray over that name. Because September is a great month to invite them to church. That you asked for a series, it's going to be great. Invite somebody. Invite that person. And if you're struggling to think of a person, pray. And then get around some other people. God will answer that prayer. God, open my eyes to who needs to know you. He will answer that prayer every time. Invite them to church. Be a bringer. But before you invite them, pray first. Pray first. And listen, can I ask you to pray for the month of September? Because, you know, I shared with our leadership yesterday that I believe the month of September is going to see increase for this church. I believe the month of September is going to be a harvest for this church. I believe that they're going to see, we're going to see so many people here that we're going to need extra hands to be laborers. We're going to need people that can serve the people that are going to come here in September. So pray for it. Pray that laborers, workers would would come, that people would get involved so that we can point the way to Jesus, so that we can see the lost come to Christ because I believe it's gonna happen. I believe it's gonna be a pivotal moment for our church, in fact. So pray first for the lost. And here's the last one. Pray for your needs. Pray for your needs. Maybe this is easy for you, but I want you to think about it in these terms. The next time you get a headache, take some medicine. But before you do, pray. Pray first. The next time you have a dilemma, sure, go solve the dilemma in your life, but pray first. I want prayer to be the one thing that we do first to let God know that he is a priority and that his will is a priority. And I want to share with you a prophetic truth from Scripture. In Philippians chapter 4, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by what? Prayer. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And if you will do that, what happens then? Then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So if you will go to God in prayer, he will give you peace. It's a prophetic truth that I think many of us need to hear. You'll be different if you'll just pray first. You will see your circumstances shift if you will pray first. The principle is pray first. Pray first. Because listen... Some of us have gotten out of the habit. 
We're sending our kids off to school and we say, did you do your homework? Did you, did you remember to take your book? And we're rushing them out the door. And that's the last thing they hear before they enter a school that they're up against all kinds of odds. Instead, it should be God. Touch him. Help him to be a leader and not a follower. In Jesus' name. Or God, help her to recall the things she did not study, right? (laughs) That's true for many kids. Pray first. I want to invite the worship team to go ahead and come back up. But our mantra, our two words are what? Pray first. That's okay.